a very good afternoon to one and all hope everybody is doing good and following strict lockdown rules all of this is for our safety and please do not take things easy okay be clean keep your surroundings clean regularly wash your hands for at least 10 20 seconds on that apart coming back to our class there were some question and answers asked by students in the previous session as i have been teaching you with the full screen I would only be able to see the question and answers once I complete the session. So let me answer the questions that were asked in the previous session. Okay, let us start the session by asking the answering the previous asked questions. There was a question asked by Dinesh Kumar Mahapatra, sir. Does temperature increase with increase in energy? Okay, the answer for this is as we are referring to heat energy there will be an increase in temperature obviously and there is an increase in the vibrational energy of the atoms or molecules of the substance okay therefore we can say that the temperature will be increasing as the energy increases one more question that is posed is an interesting question actually is con conduction only in solid sir this is asked by lanka subash okay he is actually our uh, final year student, he is not the third year student. Some of our final year friends are also here. They have joined us to learn the subject because they are also having the same subject this uh, semester. He has asked us that conduction is only in solids, sir. Okay. The answer to this is conduction occurs in all three states of matter, solids, liquids and gases. But because of the arrangement of molecules is more closer in solids, we can say that solids are best for conduction one more question this is from your batch mate uh, mohan sai he has asked is there any video to explain the principle of thermography mm, okay i have a video i'll just play it and before that let me just quickly revise the principle so that everybody would be able to understand it okay Every object whose surface temperature is above absolute zero, I told you in the previous class also, that refers to zero uh, Kelvin, refers to minus 273.15 centigrade. It radiates energy at a wavelength corresponding to its surface temperature. Utilizing high sensitive infrared cameras, it is possible to convert this radiated energy into a thermal image of the object being surveyed. This was the principle that we discussed in the previous class. And then what we do is we color these thermograms so that it will be easy for us to identify the problematic areas. And the color coding will be something like this. The cooler colors will be blue, violet, indigo, etc. And as you go towards the red, it will be warmer. So here is the video that I was talking about. I got one video for you guys which explains this basic principle. Not exactly the principle, but it is somewhat related to that. So, just have a look at the video. Thermal imaging devices work in the infrared spectrum of the light. Each object of the scene emits infrared waves in the form of heat. The infrared waves are captured and transmitted by the IR objective made from the sophisticated crystals germanium and then focused towards the infrared detector of the thermal imaging device. The infrared detector is composed of tiny sensitive elements, commonly known as pixels. These interact with the infrared waves and read them while at the same time they generate electronic impulses with different values. These impulses are then processed by the electronics to a digital image that is viewed on screen in the viewfinder. So this is a small video which depicts the basic principle, not exactly the principle, but how this whole thing works out. Okay. So we were discussing this topic actually, I told you in the previous class also, this is one of the most important topics in this unit because this is your long answer question. 
infrared thermography is basically of two types one is active second one is passive your active infrared thermography can further be classified into two categories optical which is also called as external excitation and second category is mechanical which is also known as internal excitation further your optical or external excitation is classified into pulsed and lock in thermography whereas your mechanical or internal excitation is further can be called or can be classified into vibrothermography which further is classified into two categories burst vibrothermography and lock in vibrothermography in the last class we have started already active thermography and i have already explained you this diagram whenever we are using an external stimulus or an external source of heating for provide for capturing the ir image such type of thermography is known as ir uh, sorry active thermography we discuss this also external excitation examples photographic flashes halogen lamps which we'll be using we'll be seeing them in the class today pulsed thermography i think we stopped here so this is where we have to exactly start pulsed thermography slide number 34 i hope everybody has got this pulsed thermography slide number 34 so what you can see in the image whenever i told you number of times whenever you see an image first try to identify all the parts then try to find a correlation between them what exactly is the functionality of these things how would they affect the total diagram as a whole that would give you a complete picture of the scenario so let us see the parts here there is a specimen you can call this as a specimen towards your left i'm going to point out the mouse here a moment so i think uh, you can see the pointer here this is your specimen here and on the specimen there is a foreign object which is non homogeneous like it is making the object non homogeneous because this is a foreign object there is a thermal camera that is there there is a flash ir source and also there is a flash generator i am moving the mouse pointer i hope everybody is able to understand it. this is your flash here and this is your flash generator there is a flash thermography system as well and also there is an analysis pc okay so your pulsed thermography comes under your active thermography your pulsed thermography comes under your active thermography that means we need to use an external source and that external source here is the flash that is why it is also called as your flash thermography your pulse ther thermography is also known by one more name which is known as flash thermography the source of external excitation used in your pulse thermography is a flash okay i'm going to the go to the next slide so this is also same diagram similar diagram but the basic idea of giving you two diagrams is that this diagram is good for looking it looks aesthetic it's very authentic but still whenever you are trying to draw this in your examination it is not practically possible for you to draw it as it is okay so for your examination point of view i'm going to give certain images which will be easier for you guys to draw this is this is also the same diagram it also depicts the same concept of your pulse thermography okay but it is easier to draw in comparison to this diagram so let us discuss this one as well it has got a processing unit there is a display there is a ir camera there is a heat source which is a flash lamp and also there is a specimen and in this specimen you are having subsurface defect i told you in the previous class subsurface defects are defects which are lying just below to the surface of the specimen not exactly on the surface but just a couple of units below to the surface there is a heat source flash lamp there are two flash lamps here on one heat source it is written as transmission i hope you can see in the back end here it is written as transmission here it is written as reflection these two are actually two different methodologies of your pulse thermography we will be discussing these two in the coming slides but for now just understand the total concept of your pulse thermography you are using an external source and this external source is your flash lamp whenever you are going to use an external source 
and if at all this external source of excitation happens to be a flash lamp then it is known as your pulse thermography for the time being don't worry about your transmission method or reflection method i am going to discuss both of them in the coming slides i'll go to the, i'm going to go to the next slide right now we are in slide number 35 i'm moving to slide number 36 just the matter i'll read through it pulsed thermography is also called burst thermography or flash thermography or square pulse thermography it has got different names but most popular are your pulse thermography and also flash thermography a flash thermography system uses its own heat source to induce heat into the part you're using its own heat source that is your flash this is done to allow an active examination of the thermal behavior at the surface of the part the flash lamp creates a short high energy heat pulse which is directed at the surface of the part so it is going to create a short it is going to be, be there only for a short duration but it is of high energy heat pulse which is directed at the surface of the part the flash duration is often in the order of 2 milliseconds or less the objective is to illuminate and therefore heat the part surface captured by a thermal camera as evenly as possible almost this is the same concept that you are going to use in your digital photography you might have seen people who click photographs etc for your marriages function sets all at all etc and also your portfolios and all they will be projecting huge flashes onto the subject which they are going to take that is because they want to create or they want to capture an image which is as evenly as possible filled with light and here for us it should be filled with heat the flash duration is often of the order of 2 milliseconds or less the object is to illuminate and therefore heat so it illuminates and also heats the part surface captured by a thermal camera as evenly as possible I'm going to the next slide slide number 37 the created thermal wave penetrates the part in depth and travels back to the surface which is being observed by the camera so whatever heating that is caused on the surface that generates a thermal wave this thermal wave penetrates into the object and after heating the back surface it is going to come back and all this is being observed by the camera in a homogeneous region of the part with no defect heat travels at the same rate this is quite obvious whenever there is no external material the uniformity of material is there in the region the heat travels at the same rate however an area with a defect such as a delamination a void or a foreign material inclusion disturbs the thermal wave on the surface so whenever some defect is there there will be some disturbance to the propagation of your thermal wave the way it travels will be changing the thermal camera records the changes in surface temperature by capturing a thermal video consisting of many image frames so it actually captures a thermal video consisting of many image frames then what happens next the software of the flash thermography system then post processes that thermal video sequence and performs complex maths on a pixel by pixel basis the temporal changes or differences of the thermal wave are converted to contrast changes in the resultant image different mathematical algorithms have been developed to accomplish this some work better for fast responding materials such as metals and some others work better for materials that don't conduct heat very well such as carbon composites or your plastics so i hope you guys have understood this so let me go back and let me quickly revise what exactly happens here or let me explain you this in fact in your pulse thermography what is going to happen is that you are going to use an external source excitation source which is your flash this flash is going to be focused for a very small duration for conductive materials it is very very less 2 milliseconds or even less than that 
and for non conductive materials it will be varying from a couple of seconds to maximum a couple of minutes that is for your non conductive materials but for a regular very good conductive material it will be very short duration and in this short duration this flash will be heating up the surface and it is going to create a thermal wave and this thermal wave penetrates into the object and after going into the object if at all any devoids or any delamination anything any defect is there then it comes back and this is captured by your camera the thermal capture camera records this thing okay in the form of a video in the form of thermal changes temp surface temperature changes in the form of a video that means it is going to capture the temperature initially and then after a couple of seconds or after maybe a couple of milliseconds what is happening to the same temperature because of the propagation of the wave and coming back of the wave obviously there will be a change in the surface temperature that will also be captured all this will be captured in the form of a thermal video consisting of many image frames and there will be a software that will be post processing all this video sequence and performs complex operations pixel by pixel okay and what it does is it results in finally an image although it captures a total video of the thing it will be giving you an output as a image which will give you the thermal difference the thermal contrast in the resultant image for doing this various algorithms have been developed some of them work better with the metals which are very good conductors and some of them which although they are going to take a bit of time they are going to work well with your carbon composites or plastics so all this is the matter that you have to write in your pulse thermography as i was telling you there are two modes of your pulse therm thermography one is your reflection mode you can see the diagram now there is a computer real time processor ir camera is there there is a specimen which is also your target and the flash lamp is in front of the specimen here the flash lamp is located in front of the specimen here this mode is known as your reflection mode of pulse thermography in this mode the inspecting defect is closer to the heated surface so because the flash is here obviously this surface is the surface which will be the heated surface and this method will be used whenever the defect is closer to the heated surface that means if at all the defect is lying somewhere closer to this surface i think you can see the mouse pointer i'm moving the mouse pointer here if at all the surface the defect is closer to this surface then we are going to use the reflection mode of pulse thermography and when we are going to use transmission mode is that like obviously you can see in the diagram the flash lamp is placed at the back of the specimen whereas your infrared camera is on this side that is this is the front end let us assume that this is your front end where your ir camera is there the flash lamp is kept at the back that means the defect is away from the heated surface that means it is closer towards the back surface of the specimen in such a scenario what we will be doing is that we will be placing the flash lamp at the back of the specimen this type of method is known as your transmission mode of pulse thermography there are two modes one is reflection where the flash cam flash lamp will be in front of the specimen or in the same direction of your ir camera whereas your transmission mode your flash lamp will be placed at the back end of the specimen or in the opposite side of your ir camera i hope you guys have got it there is a small video related to your pulse thermography let us watch this video now
so that's the end of the video here we'll go to there is one more video i'll play this video as well Hi, this is John Cabrera for MobiTherm Advanced Thermography Solutions. Today I'm going to be demonstrating for you our pulse thermography non-destructive testing system using the FLIR A6700SC, which is a cooled uh, camera from FLIR, and our IRNDT system fitted with a pulse flash generator, uh, which delivers six kilojoules of energy uh, using a uh, commodity flash bulb. So, what we've done is we've placed a uh, three-ply uh, pre-preg composite sandwich into which we've placed a defect made of uh, three mil uh, polyfilm, which is the film that covers the cloth before it is assembled. So we're using that to simulate a defect where someone has inadvertently left a contaminant uh, during the assembly of a part. So we've got uh, our hardware rack, which consists of the PC and the excitation hardware that triggers everything, captures the video for the camera. We have our cooled camera, and we have the flash and fa flash generator off camera that you can't see, and that comprises the entire system. Now, for larger areas, you can get uh, a second flash unit or slave multiple units together and get larger coverage. Uh, but for this size sample, up to about uh, 12 to 14 inches square, you can pretty much get the job done with a single, a single flash bulb. Now I've got a previous result here, but just for the sake of the video, we're gonna go through the wizard again and recreate our workspace, which is a pulse workspace. The wizard will present us with the right piece of hardware that needs to be used, which is a flash generator, six kilojoule. And we're going to run the camera in free run at its fastest frame rate, which is 125 frames per second for one second. Now I just want to check my workspace, make sure everything makes sense. 125 frames, one second. Now with flash, there is always the possibility of eye damage. So it's recommended that everyone wear eye protection or that the environment in which the measurements are taking place are protected from direct line of sight uh, to the flash or to the surface that is being flashed. So we're running this flash generator at 100% of intensity. And so what I will do is I will give a three second countdown in three, two, one. And now we have our result. So I will select the second derivative function. And now I will start dialing into the material. So right now we're basically at the surface and you can already sort of make out the, di the triangle shape there. But I'm gonna dial in just a little bit farther and now you can see it really developing. And there is our defect. So as you can see, it's a very quick result to obtain and it produces a very sharp contrast in the edges of the defect. And this is because of the greater sensitivity of the cooled camera and the higher frame rate. So we're able to capture very small changes in temperature that occur rapidly over time and produce a very sharp result. So if you have any other questions uh, or specific application needs that you'd like to discuss with us, you could call FLIR or MobiFirm okay. directly. And We'll go to the next slide, slide number 43. Advantages, pulse thermography is fast, you have just seen in the video. It is very fast and easy to deploy. Its experimentation time varies from a few seconds for high conductivity materials to a few minutes for low conductivity materials. I already told you this. If at all the material is a good conductor, then the experimentation time varies only, a, will be only a few seconds. And if at all it is a low conductive material, then it will be varying to up to a few minutes. Since a heat pulse can be seen as a set of several periodic thermal waves launched at once, several data points, amplitude or phase can be extracted from a single experiment. This is coming to the back end of this, what exactly is happening. In the video also you have seen, he has chosen second derivative and then the algorithm has done a lot of calculation actually. It gives an output immediately, but still it has calculated a lot of things. 
which refer to your image processing it is a subject for your ec people image processing subject will be there and it has got a number of calculations your amplitude calculations your phase change calculations all those are your back end calculations which are done and it is showing you the image output after all these calculations are done so here we are referring to this thing as a heat pulse can be seen as a set of several periodic thermal waves number of thermal waves it can be seen as a set of several thermal several periodic thermal waves which are launched at once several data points that is each wave will be associated with its own amplitude and each wave will be associated with its own phase can be extracted from a single experiment this is one of the advantages with this which is not available in your lock in fourth one advantage is that pulse thermography is sensitive to voids and inclusions in the material which are difficult to detect so it can detect them very easily disadvantages or limitations the data processing of pulse thermography technique is complex as compared to lock in you will be seeing the lock in te technique in the coming slides lock in will be much more easier that means the data processing will be much more easier when compared to your pulse thermography here in your pulse thermography a lot of algorithms will be running a lot of calculation needs to be done the results are affected by non uniform heating emissivity variations environmental reflections and surface geometry all these are factors which are going to affect the results these are non uniform heating that is possible sometimes emissivity variations okay we discussed about emissivity in the last class emissivity variations are there those are going to affect the output obviously environmental reflections if at all there are any reflections which are caused due to the surrounding environment that is also going to affect the output that is generated and also the surface geometry plays a very very important role in the output okay next one we are going to go to lock in thermography so we have completed pulse thermography till now and we are going to go to lock in thermography this is slide number 44 once again there is a image and always whenever there is image i keep on saying this you identify all the parts there are a set of instruments at the top which are there is a ultrasound there is a microwave there is a eddy current there is flash lamp slash halogen lamp and there is a thermal emitter if at all you observe or if at all you see all these seem to be your external excitation sources i am repeating once again there is ultrasound that you see in the image there is a microwave there is an eddy current there is a flash lamp or halogen lamp and also there is a thermal emitter if at all you observe all of them they are all clubbed together by a ellipse these seem to be the external excitation sources that means whenever you are going to go for lock in thermography you are going to use any one of them as your external excitation source the other parts the ir camera the specimen the defect the computer the result all these things are same similar but what is varying here is that in the previous case in your flash thermography or your pulse thermography there was only a flash lamp that was used whereas here in your lock thermo lock in thermography number of things can be used as your activation sources it can be thermal emitters it can be ultrasound it can be microwave it can be eddy current and it can be a flash lamp or a halogen lamp but mostly you'll be using a halogen lamp but all these are possible cases and one more important thing that you have to underline or identify here whenever you are discussing with lock in thermography is modulated thermal energy what is meant by modulated generally your modulated means modified or controlled so the thermal energy provided is controlled or changed or given in a specific pattern please remember this the lock in thermography has got a modulated thermal energy the thermal energy provided is controlled or changed or given in a specific pattern generally your modulation means if at all 10 students are there in the classroom the voice pitch that i would be using would be different and i would be using a different voice pitch if at all there are 62 students in the classroom so any of the mentioned sources mentioned sources are used to send a modulated thermal energy that means any of the sources are used for sending in a 
modulated that is modified or a specific pattern thermal energy to the specimen i just gave an example of that 10 students and 60 students thing uh, in comparison to your voice modulation so here you are using a modulated thermal energy source that is one important thing that you have to remember we we'll go to go to next slide as i told you this is aesthetic thing which you need not draw in your examination this is for your understanding slide number 44 is for your understanding and slide number 45 is something that you will be drawing in your examination so here as you can see clearly we are using halogen lamps as our source in this step okay and the wave coming out is a sinusoidal wave you observe should have observed this by now it is a control unit ir camera pc specimen halogen lamps and the wave that is coming out is a sinusoidal wave okay there is a amplitude change amplitude and phase are also shown here in the diagram that is will be the output we will discuss about that in the coming slides i hope everybody got the diagram there are two halogen lamps in your flash thermography there was only one flash lamp that was used but in your lock-in thermography you are going to use two halogen lamps for the specimen lock-in thermography is also known as modulated thermography because it is going to use modulated thermal energy in this methodology the surface of the specimen is periodically illuminated by a modulated heating source that means this heating source will be sending out heat waves in specific intervals of time periodically it will be illuminate illuminated by a modulated heating source periodically and this heat source can be anything which we have seen in the previous slide so the surface of the object being examined and analyzing the result resulting local temperatures on the surface of the object okay i'll read it once again in this methodology the surface of the specimen is periodically illuminated by a modulated heating source to the surface of the object being examined and analyzing the resulting local temperatures on the surface of the object next point when the input energy wave penetrates the object surface it is absorbed and a phase is being shifted a phase shift happens when the input wave reaches areas within the object where the thermophysical properties are not homogeneous in relation to the surrounding materials the input wave is partially deflected so whenever it is going to reach a defect the input wave is partially defected uh, partially reflected sorry the reflected portion of the wave interferes with the incoming input wave at the surface of the object causing an interference pattern in the local surface temperature so already we discussed that here we are going to send the heat waves periodically so what is going to happen one wave is going to penetrate into the surface and then it is going to reach a defect and it is going to come back and by the time it comes back there is one more wave that is already coming from your source so there will be an interference pattern that is going to happen in the local surface temperature the internal structure of the object being examined can then be derived by evaluating the phase shift of the local surface temperatures in relation to the input energy wave so you'll be having the phase of your input energy wave and we'll also be measuring the phase that is of the coming output wave and whenever there is a phase shift due to this local surface temperature difference that is going to give us an information that there is a defect the ability to derive internal thermophysical inconsistencies within the object however requires that the input energy source be used at an optimal frequency which depends on both the thermophysical characteristics of the object as well as its thickness so obviously we have to use or we have to set up a optimal frequency levels which depends upon the thermophysical characteristics of the object as well as its thickness depending upon these things we are going to set up an optimal frequency without setting up an optimal frequency we are not going to get a good result in this one so here in this slide what i wanted to show you is that there is a halogen lamp and from this halogen lamp there is a sinusoidal wave that has come out and here in the diagram 
above it is your input sinusoidal wave and below in the diagram you can see the output amplitude and phase delay this delay is caused because there is a defect in the specimen due to this defect some of the waves are reflected and some of them are observed as we told or as we discussed in the previous slides and due to this there is a delay or there is a phase change or there is a delay and this delay gives you an idea of the defect that is present so this will be the output that we will be getting for this this always remains in the back end actually and all this is again going to the algorithm and it will be getting a image only so there is a small video for this we'll have a look at the video Hello, I'm John Cabrera for MobyTherm Advanced Thermography Solutions, and today I'm going to be demonstrating our lock-in solution for IR non-destructive testing. So with lock-in, we have some advantages over transient, another of our methods, uh, for measuring panels such as this, where you have a sandwich of honeycomb in the center, which is a very fast conductor, and composite overlays on the outside where you have more of an insulating effect. The lock-in method is a little trickier to set up, but it produces much sharper results when it works. In this particular sample, we've got all kinds of occlusions, delaminations, impact defects. Um, all of those can be detected with the lock-in method. Uh, it's a method that uses what's called a lock-in amplifier. And there's a whole bunch of math behind this, but essentially the basics of it is you introduce a signal of a fixed frequency. In this case, our signal is our halogen lamp, and that signal is a sinusoidal wave, so it moves up into intensity and then down in intensity, and we repeat the signal over and over, introducing the heat with that frequency component into the part, and then the camera watches that same uh, component of heat come out of the part. Now in order to do that you need a very sensitive camera so we're using a cooled camera now we're using a FLIR 6700 and it is a cooled camera with much greater sensitivity than an uncooled microbolometer and so it's able to see very minute changes in the phase of the part as the heat is coming in and out and this is important because the delaminations the uh, other defects that are in the part, what they do is they speed up and slow down the absorption and transmission of heat through the part. And once we use the fast Fourier transforms of the lock-in amplifier to remove our frequency component, that is everything that matches what our light is doing, when we subtract that, what is left is those things that caused aberrations. They, they caused uh, something to stay out of phase from our signal. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those type of defects. So I'm going to set up the workspace uh, using the wizard. So today we're going to select lock in. There's other choices, but this is what we're going with today. Lock in. We're going to select the excitation source to be our halogen lamp dimmer. The uh, modulation is going to be sinusoidal. When measuring other things like solar panels or uh, integrated circuits, which are both uh, things that we can inspect with lock in, we would choose the rectangular or a rectangle or square wave excitation, uh, but for this lamp, because it is a very slow reacting element in there, we're gonna choose sinusoidal. That way we'll get a nice smooth curve up and down. And we're gonna let the camera run in free run. Okay, so now our workspace is set up. The camera's connected. I need to change one thing here, and that is we want to set up the number of periods. That is, how many times are we going to turn the light on and off? And I'm going to say that's going to be four. And then the duration of that period is going to be five seconds. So it's going to be five seconds of on and off. Now it's telling me that it's going to take 601 images. So this is going to be a stack of images, of thermal images, showing the heat up and cool down. And what we'll do is pixel by pixel, we'll drill down. If you drill down through that, 
what you should see is a graph, a sinusoidal graph representing exactly what we input with the lamp. And in those pixels where you have defects, what you'll see is that that graph is phase shifted. So it's not in line with the excitation signal indicating that there might be a defect there. And once we have the resulting image, I'll show you what that looks like. So the entire measurement will take 20 seconds, five seconds on, five seconds off type of thing. And one advantage that this has over transient is that motion in the background is not as uh, detrimental to the results unless that motion happens to be in sync with our frequency. That is, if somebody is dancing to these lights, then we would have a problem. But otherwise, all of the background uh, noise is eliminated. So we have our first result here. I'm going to brighten it up a little bit by moving the, the contrast sliders. And then I'm going to turn on the EQ. And there we can see that we have a defect up in the upper right. It's fairly large. And that is most likely missing adhesive on the part. I can't see anything from the side, so I'm assuming that it's going to be missing adhesive. But the reason it's showing there is because when there's adhesive mi missing, you don't have a direct bond between the aluminum and the composite. And so that heat that's hitting there isn't traveling in at the same rate and coming back out. So once we throw away all of the other frequency components, that's what we're left with is our defect. So that's lock-in in a nutshell. If you have any questions or if you have a specific okay, we'll need that we can help slide. you. These are your advantages and disadvantages as far as your lock-in thermography are concerned. I'll read through them. Advantages first, energy required to perform a lock-in experiment is generally less than in other active techniques which is helpful if a lower power source is to be used or if a special care has to be given to the inspected part example cultural heritage pieces works of art frescoes etc okay frescoes are your uh, paintings as far as uh, i know I'm not sure about it, but I think they are your paintings uh, painted on uh, oil or something. I'm not sure. Something related to paintings, okay? Works of art, frescoes. Is there a cultural heritage pieces? So, what exactly is going to happen here is that, so these cultural heritage pieces, there are chances that sometimes they might get damaged. So, time to time, there are some preservative measures that will be taken. And for doing a test on these things, or how you will know where exactly there is a problem or where might there might be a problem that might be occurring. So NDT plays a very, very important role in testing such things because they should not be damaged. They should not be moved from their place and face still there is a test that has to be done on them. And NDT, especially your thermal imaging, if at all, you are using a low power source, which is the case with your lock-in thermography, unlike your Flash thermography varies in the power source is very, very high. Here, it's a low power source. This will be an advantage for such cases. Disadvantages, it is in general slower than other approaches such as your pulse thermography. Pulse thermography took only a couple of seconds or just a single flash to get the image. Whereas, this has to be a modulated signal. That means it has to use up, go, go through a specific pattern. Extra hardware that is lock-in amplifier is needed in order to retrieve the amplitude and phase of the response. Okay. Applications, determination of coatings thickness, determination of delaminations, determination of local fiber orientation, detection of corrosion. All these are various applications related to your lock-in thermography. Next one that we are going to see is internal excitation or mechanical excitation or vibrothermography. There is an image and obviously you have to understand the components there. There is a processing system along with the display. There is a control. There is an IR camera. There is a specimen. All these things have been common from your starting days or from your starting of this thermography sessions. What is new here is your ultrasound probe. There is an ultrasound probe that is used. Previously, 
in your pulse thermography you used a flash lamp in your lock in thermography you used a halogen lamp but here no such things are available instead of them you are using a ultrasound probe here what is the purpose of your ultrasound probe you have studied in your unit number 2 ultrasound probe generates ultrasound ultrasonic energy or ultrasonic waves which pass through the specimen and get reflected back you might have studied all that in your unit number 2 i think i have taught you so you might be knowing that so let us go to the next slide there is one more similar image ir camera there is a thermal response the defect is there the converter ultrasound generator is there all these things are there this is another oriented the same image projected in a different manner there is a frame gap grabber in your pc there is a dft red fourier transformer transformer converter is there okay all those things are software which are there in that it is also known as ultrasound thermography or also known by a name as name thermosonics vibrothermography is also known as ultrasound thermography or thermosonics it utilizes mechanical waves to directly simulate the internal defects and without heating the surface as in optical methods it utilizes mechanical waves to directly stimulate the internal defects and without heating the surface as in optical methods you have to understand this whenever you are using an optical method what is going to happen obviously the optical heat is going to first reach the surface and then it is going to pass into the object whereas here we are using a mechanical wave which will directly stimulate the internal defect without heating the surface so this is the difference between your internal excitation and your external excitation next point the ultrasound wave is produced within specimen by a transducer made of a stack of piezo elements and concentrated in a titanium horn that acts like a hammer if at all you have studied ultra sonic testing unit very well you might have known about this piezo elements what is the significance of piezo electric effect in your transducers and all those things we have discussed in our unit number 2 okay next one after the elastic waves are injected to the specimen they travel through the material and dissipate their energy mostly at the defects so heat is locally released what happens here whenever these heat waves sorry these uh, ultrasound waves they are injected into the specimen they travel through the material because they are of having high frequency they travel through the material and dissipate their energy mostly at the defects so heat is only generated at the defects this heat wave then travels by conduction to the surface where they can be detected by by an ir camera so again this is of two types one is lock in second one is burst thermography first we will study about lock in vibro thermography there is an image here slide number 55 there is a processor there is a display there is a ir camera control unit ultrasonic transducer is there there is a coupling media again this relates to your unit number 2 always whenever you are dealing with your ultrasonic energy a coupling media or coupling couplant plays a very 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 important role without couplant what is going to happen is that there will be a lot of losses that will be happening okay we have studied all these things in our unit 2 let us not waste our time on that so coupling media is there there are internal defects there is a specimen and the output signal is also shown here this setup is known as your lock in vibro thermography lock in vibro thermography this is analogous to your lock in thermography it is also called as amplitude modulated vibro thermography in this a mechanical elastic wave at high frequency is injected into the specimen sonic waves propagate in the material and when they encounter a defect they trigger the dissipation of vibration energy into the heat mainly by friction 
heat is conducted to the surface where it can be detected by the IR camera. So, at the side there is one more image, here there is an input signal and there is also an output signal. The response signal is also read out by your IR camera. Okay. Obviously, there is a difference because of the defects which are present. Burst thermography. If at all you observe the diagrams for your burst thermography and your lock in thermography, I am going to go back for that. Both look very much similar to each other. But there is a very small difference between them. Let me tell you the difference. The coupling media, the ultrasonic transducer, control unit, specimen, IR camera processor, everything is almost same between both your burst vibrothermo graphy and your lock-in vibrothermography. But what is the variation is that in burst thermography, a burst of ultrasonic waves are injected into the test specimen for a short time. It varies from milliseconds to few seconds. Ultrasonic burst UVP uses only short ultrasound bursts to derive phase angle images. The heating up followed by a cooling down period is recorded by the infrared camera. The local spectral components of that signal provide information about defects in a similar way to the ULT technique. But with an improved robustness, ultrasonic lock-in technology, ULT refers to ultrasonic lock-in technology technique, but with an improved robustness against coupling problems and faster time than ULT. So, what is going to happen here is that in burst, burst vibrothermography, a burst of ultrasonic waves are injected into the test specimen for a very short time. It varies from a milliseconds to few seconds. This short burst of your ultrasound derives phase angle images. The heating up followed by a cooling down period is recorded by the infrared camera because you are sending them in a burst, there will be a obviously heating up followed by a cooling down period and this will be recorded by the infrared camera. The local spectral components of that signal provide information about defects in a similar way to that, similar to your previous technology that is your lock-in thermography, lock-in vibrothermography, sorry, lock-in vibrothermography. But with an improved robustness against coupling problems, whatever coupling problems that are possible in your lock-in that are not going to happen in your burst thermography. Advantages of vibrothermography in either lock-in or burst configuration, vibrothermography is extremely fast. Defect detection is independent from its orientation inside the specimen and both internal and open surface defects can be detected. It is most appropriate technique to inspect some type of defects, example micro cracks, delaminations etc. There is only minimal heating of the inspected specimen since energy is usually dissipated mostly at the defective areas. Disadvantages, it is necessary to relocate the transducer to cover a large area of inspection. Hence, vibrothermography is only suitable for relatively small objects. The most inconvenient aspect of VT is the need of a coupling media between the sample and the transducer because we are using ultrasonic obviously a coupling media is required. A bad coupling implies a poor ultrasound transmission but more precisely it creates unwanted heat in the vicinity of the ultrasound injection unit in the ultrasound injection point. Next one is passive thermography. I told you infrared thermography is of two types active and passive. So, we have completed all the subcategories in your active portion and we have come to passive thermography. There is an image here, IR camera is there, display processor is there, slide number 61 please. I hope everybody is having slide number 61. There is a processor, there is a display, there is IR camera, there is IR radiation and what is missing here? We do not have an excitation source, that is external excitation source is not there. 
the object itself is at a higher temperature therefore it is emitting naturally ir radiation which can be captured by your ir camera so there is no external activation source such thermography is known as passive thermography in passive thermography the features of interest are naturally at a higher or lower temperature than the background so because of this temperature variation it will be easier for your ir camera to capture the difference example surveillance of people on a scene so you can relate it to your present scenario you can see thermal images or thermal surveillance being imposed on citizens to find out people who are with corona what is going to happen people who are suffering with corona they are going to obviously have an elevated temperature by surveilling the people on a scene easily with a thermal thermographic technology you can find out the people who are having higher temperature in comparison to others okay all objects above absolute zero emit thermal infrared energy so thermal cameras can passively see all objects regardless of ambient light so this is something which previously we have discussed there are number of applications to this passive thermography actually for different sectors let us see sector wise the applications okay production sector inspection of printed circuit boards or icbs to detect solder bridges and overheating components if at all any defects are there in your soldering process or any overing overheating happens such things can be easily found out seam tracking in arc welding you can easily relate to this your welding process seam tracking in your arc welding process third one in the production of metals recording of temperature profiles enables monitoring of steel quality in continuous casting that is self explanatory fourth point in the paper industry infrared thermography monitors quality in the production of high gloss paper in the maintenance sector inspection of turbine blades in jet engines can be inspected thermal insulation of building envelopes heated floors furnace walls all these things can be inspected estimation of liquid levels in tanks this also can be inspected early detection of transformer overheating this is related to your electrical next sector is medicine in this evaluation of patients with disorders of the musculoskeletal system so this is again related to the present scenario where you are testing the patients for corona similar monitoring of road traffic in the ease of monitoring of road traffic infrared thermography enables moving road vehicles which will be hotter than their surroundings detection of forest fires safety of forest areas through early detection of smoldering fires astronomy satellites with infrared imaging capabilities are also used to monitor the earth's weather to study vegetation patterns geology to measure surface ocean and cloud temperatures military sector revealing the presence of potential targets in poor visibility conditions example at night or in fog second one air to air detection of incoming enemy missiles or aircraft from their hot exhaust gases third one surveillance in security law enforcement and defense all these things are self explanatory i guess all these things if at all you see what is common in all these applications is that there is a natural variation in temperature from the object under test to its specimen so whenever there is a natural temperature variation between an object and its surroundings in such cases you can use a passive thermographic technique so this is an end of it in the next class which will be the last class for this unit i suppose we are going to start off with heat sensitive paints okay i'm going to stop my lecture here whatever q and a are there we are going to uh, 